Hello, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I reckon I've got the toughest slot, actually, passive house and introduction in 20 minutes. And I hope I'm not speaking to preaching to the converted, hopefully preaching to the converted and not the technically excellent, uh, as I'm sure a lot of you are. So um, I'll give it my best shot and uh, eyes down for a, a quick ride. So an introduction to passive house. Um, so what is passive house, first question? Again, most of you know this answer, but I'll, I'll give it a bash. A self-heating house, I put here, not entirely true, but I think it's not far off the truth. Um, everyone who knows Passive House knows that nice diagram there, and it basically is a nice little uh, ditty of kind of what it is, how it works in relation to the house heating itself via uh, the sun's um, radiation, internal heat gains, and the use of mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. And in, in a nutshell, that's what actually creates the heating for, if you like, the self-heating house. So why do it? Well, it's quite evident why we need to do it in relation to fuel and carbon dioxide savings. And around about a 60, 65% reduction in uh, consumption of be it fuel, be it CO2, kind of depends on the mix in relation to even standard building regulations from 2010. From the 2006 ones, it was about a 75% reduction. So, you know, that's the reason to do Passive House. It's about energy, it, it, and the carbon dioxide bit is obviously a bit of a difficult one because it totally deploys, depends on which fuel source you're using. When did it begin? I love this photo. <laughs> 1988. I want to know who the chap at the back is, actually, down, down there. But uh, from Dr. Wolfgang Feist and Bo Adamson, in 1988, uh, the concept was conceived of Passive House. And this is one of the first projects in 1991 in Darmstadt. Um, and there's interesting facts here in relation to the inside temperatures showing it wasn't overheating, but also in, in, um, uh, in the winter, basically showing that no heating system was being turned on even as we were going minus 0 degrees Celsius it was, in effect, heating itself via, as I said, the solar gain, the internal heat, and the MVHR unit. So, how is heat generated in a passive house? As I mentioned, passive solar makes up around 43% incidental internal heat gains. That's from lighting, from appliances, from you, me, uh, in the house. Um, that makes up um, uh, around 26%. And then the 31% is in heating, and the heating system, as I mentioned, the mechanical vent heat recovery. So how is the heat lost? And obviously the balance between the one and the other must be the same. Well, as you can see there, uh, it's through um, transmission through uh, the, the fabric itself. The fabric itself is never going to be 100% uh, efficient, but if you like, that's the main part of a passive house, keeping the heat in. And it's lost, as you can see here, through, mostly through the glazing, through the doors, also through thermal bridges. Um, and it's how we minimize those is the important part of Passive House. How we minimize the loss of heat uh, is vital. And I'll talk about the project in Ebba Vale later of two different approaches to actually meeting the same goal. Um, and obviously there will be some air movement. Um, Berthold mentioned air tightness. Now air tightness is obviously king with Passive House, so we don't want drafts to remove the heat we've already created. So, again, most of you will know this, but I'll reiterate them anyway. What are the headline elements of a passive house? So, 15 kilowatt hours per meter squared per, per annum in terms of um, the, the, the amount of heat required. And in terms of the heat, maximum heat load, how much maximum heat is required at any period, that's 10 watts per meter squared as a maximum. Now, in relation to comfort, then, the air tightness I talked about, and what you're aiming for in passive house is 0 0.6 meters cubed per hour per meter squared in relation to the air tightness. Overheating, big issue, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Window surface is an interesting one. I did have so many slides, I've had to cut it down, but temperature stratification in relation to the window temperature is really interesting. And a lot of the, again, I'll try to mention later in relation to cost and windows being one of the potential large costs, but once you go to double glazing, you have this potential uh, stratification of temperature. In other words, you've cold feet, warm head. 
That's why the triple glazing is new, needed to, to, to stop that. And a primary energy consumption of 120 kilowatt hours per meter square per annum. That includes appliances, uh, electrical appliances, etc. However, I often think that's quite high, and passive houses really should aim to be lower than that in relation to electricity consumption. So, in terms of what does a passive house look like, well, this varies across Europe, and something that we need to mention is it varies depending on the climatic conditions. But as an average, you quite often talk about a U-value of 0.15, windows, doors, 0.8, um, the 0.6 um, uh, air tightness, and zero or close to zero thermal bridging. In other words, that the amount of heat lost through the thermal bridges is no worse than the heat being lost through the wall, for instance. So that's the kind of thing, but it does vary, depends on climatic conditions. It's really important to say that. And what's the result? Extremely energy low use. That's why we're all doing it, saving fuel, saving energy. Energy is the primary thing. That's your typical dwelling stock. You can see how bad it is, above 250 kilowatt hours per meter square per annum. That's the new 2010 building regs where it's that coming up to 100, and that's a passive house. Well, we're down to the 15. Um, so that's why we do it. And we've often heard this, and a lot of you have seen this in this instance in terms of the 15 kilowatt hours or a peak heat load of 10 watts per meter squared, a candle's 30 watts, a lamp 100, therefore a fairly big room. All it would need would be four candles and a person. And the old uh, classic one is for your passive house, just buy yourself a big German shepherd dog, and that will be your heating system. So, a bit more detail on, on the individual elements. Back to that diagram. I will fly through that. And you can see the difference here between, if you like, a part L, standard building regulations house, and a passive house in relation to the insulation. Far more insulation, full stop in the windows, the floor, the roof, the walls. And it's all about minimizing the amount of heat that's lost. This is an important one. Often we don't think about this. And often this can be some of the detractors against passive houses. Oh my gosh, we just have to build boxes. Well, to some degree that's true. In other, in, in other degrees, there are clever ways to play with it. But what this diagram shows, that once you start making the volume to surface area ratio different, you start having a bigger surface area, basically, um, to, to where heat is lost. And therefore, you have to bulk up things like insulation. So having a, having a really good footprint of a good geometry is vitally important in a passive house, so as not to have to do extra measures to get over the fact that you've got a, a larger surface volume. Thermal bridging, I mentioned needs to be, as I said, preferably no worse than the amount of heat that's lost through the walls. Very difficult, very difficult in the UK for people to get their heads around that. So much of buildings regulation stuff we build today, people don't even think about thermal bridging. Most people I speak to just use default figures in SAP, for instance, have never thought about it in their lives. So to get from that to, to here, it's quite a sea change, and that's where a good architect is worth their money, and also a good contractor worth their money in being able to take the architect's drawing and delivering it on site. It's not rocket science, it's just good design and good practice. It really isn't rocket science, but tricky if you've never done it. This is an interesting one in relation to thermal bridging, windows. Often in the UK, we'd put the windows, uh, would be the example on the left-hand side. Well, here you're creating a huge thermal bridge and you'd have a psi value again of about 0.15, which would be the same as a default thermal bridge in something like SAP. However, somehow we have to put it actually sitting within the insulation and making sure there's insulation wrapping around the whole frame to stop the thermal bridge around the window. Interesting run around windows again. Why do we need triple, triple glazed windows? Often the, the thing about passive house and passive house costs. So you can see the different types of windows here. And in relation to the gains and the losses, so look at the difference between a single plane. But it's interesting to compare a double low E, so in other words, an A-rated window and a triple glazed window. And as you can see in there, there's lots of gains from a double glazed window, which is great to meet the demand, but also losses. However, in the triple, in the triple glazed window, what you're doing is you're actually getting gains. It's creating heating to some degree as opposed to a loss. 
It's not, it, it's actually helping, if you like, heat the property as opposed to taking it from you. That's why it's kind of so important. Air tightness, mentioned air tightness, 0.6. Good architects thing, the, the kind of red heavy pen, making sure that there's nowhere for punctuate, puncturing um, the, the air tightness membrane. Often something a bit diffi difficult and different for something like a timber frame housing company to do because most companies these days in terms of air tightness would just put OSB up um, within a timber frame, for instance, and that be it. And you can get to air tightnesses in basic practices of around three meters cubed per hour per meter squared. But to get below one needs to have different ways of doing it, whether that's taping joints and seams or whether it's using things like um, uh, membranes. Uh, tightness membranes, but that's a little bit different and a little bit different for, for people like timber framers. Again, not rocket science, just a case of knowing what to do, being taught how to do it, and doing it properly. So why is air tightness important? That's been mentioned. This is a nice little graph that shows the total space heating demand and the heat load, the peak heat load you can have in relation to air tightness. And this only goes up to 1.5. So to think we're building at 10 or 5 or 3 at best, close to show how important air tightness is. Even at 0 0.6, we're just even higher than the 10 watts that was actually needed and the 15 kilowatt hours per meter squared. So the, more, the less airtight your building is, the more energy you need to heat the thing. Pretty obvious, really, but it goes to show how, how important it actually is within that graph. Ventilation, as I've mentioned. We have to have ventilation because it's so airtight, and we have to have um, extra heat. Just our, the internal heat gains in the solar is not necessarily enough through the whole of the year, and we need it for cooling as well as heating. So we've got a mechanical vent heat recovery unit that's required in a passive house, and the air is often taken through the ground or can go directly into the property. And basically, the cold air goes through heat exchangers and it goes past, without actually touching through the heat exchangers, the warm, stale air that's being extracted. And that then, the heat is passed from the warm air, outgoing air, to the cold ingoing air, and that gives you temperature. Now, often that needs, requires some level of boost. And this is sometimes where, if you like Passive House, can have potential problems. Now, within the buildings we've done, we've used solar hot water and used the, the heat of the coils as a um, post heater to actually raise the temperature to, say, the temperature you require. However, sometimes on the coldest days, without good sun, you might require a, a certain boost. Now, that can be done through something like, uh, could be done through a standard gas boiler, or it could be done through a heat pump. However, that does have a, a extra heating system involved for that, those coldest periods. How often? They're not very, often very much, but that is a potential issue that you do need that secondary heating system often for use within a passive house. I was asked to talk about uh, verification, certification. I'm hardly going to mention it because it would bore you all rigid, and I'm sure someone else can talk about it. But if you like, that's your PHPP file. You use something called the Passive House Planning Package, which is the mother of all Excel spreadsheets. Anyone have used it, good luck to you all. Um, and it basically, you fill in all the elements of your property, about the Psi values, um, uh, the U values, everything we've talked about, air tightness, all goes into the spreadsheet, and out comes your figure of how your property's performing. And it will show you whether you've met the, st the target of 15 kilowatt hours per meter squared or 10 watts peak heat demand, and it will give you the, the reckoner to say, yes, you've done it, or no, you haven't. So why Passive House? Don't need to, to convince most of you, but I will anyway. It's a fabric-first approach, fit and forget. Often people say, you know, it's not about bling, it's about building it right first time. It's not restricted to particular technologies. You can build it out of brick and block. You can do out of timber frame. It, it doesn't particularly matter. It's obviously different ways of approaching it, but you can do it. Winter space heating, often not ideal for renewables. That's an interesting point. When we really need stuff, renewables don't often provide it. Passive house is a good way of doing it. High indoor air quality. A lot of the detractors in the UK talk about um, indoor air quality being worse. Oh, I wouldn't want MVHR. Well, studies show that actually a lot of people with asthma actually do go for passive house because it filters the air. It's like you have filtered water. 
Passive house is filtered air. As long as the MVHR unit is running properly, you actually increase and improve the indoor air quality. And I put code compliance. It's not one or the other. It does obviously help you meet uh, the, the carbon targets in the code. Wow. Been told to hurry up. Right, build cost, interesting one. There will be a talk later from Richard Whitbourne. I suggest you go to it, but I'm going to talk about it quickly. A standard social housing has dropped in price now to around about a grand to 1,200. Major house builders are building for about 700 pounds per meter squared. Self build, 12, 1,500. Now, the average construction cost of passive house in the UK is somewhere between 12, 50 maybe to, to 1,500. And this is the interesting thing about payback. Payback uh, with the way prices are going can be as low as potentially eight years in that extra uplifting cost. It's not a huge uplift, but there is a small uplift, which I'll talk about. But the important thing is the payback is so low now, why aren't we all doing it? I know some of the reasons why we're not, but I'll ask a rhetorical question. So where's the cost uplift? Windows. I talked about windows. Why triple glazed? Often people go down the route of doing a passive house and then end up shelving it to some degree because they can't afford the windows. Big potential cost, something that always needs looking at but it's very difficult to get right. The MVHR unit, yes, it costs money, and if you're already putting a gas boiler in or a heat pump, it is often seen as money over and above the standard primary heating source. So what are the solutions? Well, we have to have the MVHR unit. That's something we've got to live with. However, there are integrated products like Drexel and Vice's heat pump with MVHR unit, but they're still quite pricey. Windows, we saved a fortune on the, the second property at Ebervale here, the Limehouse, by using smaller windows compared to the one on the left. Now, some of you might not actually would rather live in the one on the left than the one on the right, but huge savings. Actually, they both met passive, they both got certified. And this is interesting, that relied on heating via solar gains. The Limehouse relies mostly on meeting the peak heat demand um, by keeping the heat in, because obviously windows are a weak link. So it's two completely different approaches to getting Passive House. You can still do it with small windows. Difficult, but it can be done. Skills, really important. Not impossible, just needs to be done properly. We need contractors, um, well, there aren't many with the, with the experience, but it can be done. Pendragon and Holbrook at Ebervale never done anything like it in their lives, and we got air tightness of 0.19. Never done it before. And this is where it can go wrong, where they didn't quite uh, do it properly on the floor. When they're doing the air test, the, it was ripping it from, from the wall. So they all sat there on a log to make it work. Now, that's cheating a little bit. So it goes to show there's things to learn and to get, to get right. It's not all plain sailing. Windows, you can see here, this was the German company who came over and showed the Brits how to install the windows. Really important. So... It's really, in that project, it was great that we had a fantastic site manager. Um, so we've developed at BRE something called the Site Sustainability Manager, which is aimed at training and certifying people, the on-site contractors, of how to, 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 de to build low-energy buildings. I wanted to put this up here because this looks so normal. It just looks like any other social house. This is actually a passive house in Kaigleishen in Bridgend. It needn't look different. There, they saved a lot of money on the windows by using PVC as opposed to wood. That pains me to say, but, but money's to be saved there. I'm trying to try and flick through. I was asked to talk about Enerfit. I'll talk one minute about Enerfit, if that's OK. <laughs> um, that, uh, Andy Simmons's house, shows the difference in, in, obviously, the heat loss. Very similar to the passive house standard for new builds. However, the differences are you can have 25 kilowatt hours instead of 15. Air tightness is of one. That's the main difference. Relatively similar to a new build. Here's a project that was um, shown in Germany between the before and after, and they basically got about 20 kilowatt hours. And finally, I just wanted to show you this, a project that we're doing in Aberdare in Wales, those beautiful properties there, Cornish type ones. We've had to take the mansard off and um, have insulated all around it. And I wanted to show you this, this is a bit of innovation at the end. That's actually a transpired solar collector here, which is an interesting way of looking at a passive house. The air comes in through there, it's made by Tata, it's heated up, and then it goes into uh, the, the MVHR. So it's preheating the heat before the MVHR. Another potential little 
innovation as to how to get that extra uplifting heat. So I whistled through the end. I hope you all understand Passive House and you're all experts now. Thank you very much. <laughs>